Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. We're excited that you're here to worship uh, with us this morning. My name is Craig Hunter. I'm one of the elders here at, uh, at Prairie View, and we'd love to, uh, we're just so excited to, to see and, and to welcome you uh, this morning. Um, we have a new sermon series this morning starting out in uh, Corinthians, so we're excited about that as well. If you are a visitor with us today, and I have seen a handful of visitors, encourage you to fill out one of these green cards, and you can put it up front in the black boxes when we come up at our time for offering and communion. A few announcements this morning. It is Graduation Recognition Sunday, so right after announcements, Zach will be coming up and he'll be giving a, uh, some recognition. So we'll uh, do that before we transition into our time of music. Elder nominations are wrapping up. We've got a couple more weeks of nominations before we uh, turn the ballot on and then the ter new terms start in July. And just wanted to touch base for just a minute. If you continue to see the same names on the ballot, uh, don't think that we're not working behind the scenes to develop new folks into those positions. Uh, we have multiple conversations behind the scenes with uh, many young, younger gentlemen in the church that we feel have leadership capabilities. And I know Joshua has mentioned a couple times, but we do have an eldership in training program. So we're really working hard to develop people behind the scenes. So when it's time for us uh, old timers to hang things up, we can turn things over to, uh, to folks and the church will continue to be in good hands. But if you have anybody that uh, you see fits the qualifications, you have a couple more weeks left to nominate them and that is on the, uh, on the website. The volleyball season is upon us. Games start tomorrow night. Uh, everybody should have been notified via email. So if you signed up to play volleyball, if you showed up one of weeks one or two and you don't have your schedule, see me or Nancy before you leave and we'll make sure you get that. So I've quickly found out that my way of taking email addresses and tracking things down was a tad bit ineffective as we've had a handful of bounce backs to us. So if you haven't got your information, make sure you uh, let either Nancy or I know and we'll get that to you. Uh, women's study starts Wednesday, June 14th, 7 p.m. here at the church. There's a sign up um, in the lobby. Looks like we probably have nine or ten people already signed up, so we're excited about that. That's a Wednesday evening and it'll meet for half a dozen Wednesdays or so, with the exception of the one that's uh, right around the 4th of July. I think it might be the 5th, so we won't meet that week. Membership Sunday, June 25th. We've been talking about this for a few weeks. Anybody who's interested in being a member or think you may be interested in being a member, that's going to be Sunday, June 25th, after church. We'll have a meal provided, so we'd love for you to sign up for that if that is something that you are interested in. Also on the 25th, baby dedication. We've had uh, many, many babies born over the last few years, and we put a stop to things during those COVID years. So we've fallen behind on baby dedications. So we're going to do a baby dedication on Sunday the 25th. You can see Zach if you have uh, someone in your family that you would like to be dedicated on that particular day. Joshua mentioned that we're going to mention this every single week until we get there. IDES food packing event is July 14th, uh, and we need 30 to 40 volunteers for that event. So uh, really going to look forward to getting the sign-up sheet out there. It's always been well attended in the past. Uh, there'll be dinner provided before we get started. Everybody will get to wear hairnets. It'll be all sorts of fun. Trust me, it will be. But we need 30 to 40 people here for that event to help, uh, help pack meals for that. Something that we've also been talking about for uh, quite some time now is uh, the sabbatical that's coming up for Ben. And I think Ben did a very good job this week on his blog post of explaining what the sabbatical is, what it isn't, what that, those six weeks are going to look like. I encourage you all to uh, read that if you haven't had a chance to do that. But just to give you kind of a sneak preview of what you'll be up against on those particular weeks where uh, Ben won't be up here. You know, it won't be Zach delivering all six sermons so that uh, we're not going to overwhelm him on top of his day job and ask him to do uh, a half a dozen sermons. You'll hear from every one of the elders. We'll uh, step up and do a sermon. I'm super excited about the one I get to deliver on July 9th and have been working on it for a while now. But you'll hear from all five of the elders and, you're here, and you'll also hear from Zach. So it'll be business as usual on Sunday mornings. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the attendance looks like because there's always certain people I look forward to hearing. Like whenever Joshua preaches, I think that's must-see TV. You kind of have to show up to hear Joshua because uh, as entertaining as he is in the five minutes that he does announcements and how he draws you in and forces you to pay attention, imagine 20, 25, 30 minutes of that. That'll be must-see TV. 
Uh, myself, you know, if I get 30 or 40 people here, I'm going to be real excited about that. So July 9th for me, if you want to either A, put it on your calendar, or B, cross it off your calendar, and maybe be a day you get to the beach or a uh, Kings Island or something like that. But uh, yeah, we're going to carry on business as usual, but we're going to ask that you contact either Zach or Nancy or one of the elders if you need anything that has to do with traditional church business, uh, whether it be a prayer item, whether it be a hospital visit, whatever that might look like, encourage you to contact one of us so Ben and Olivia can get unplugged and enjoy their time together. So kicking off our, um, our sermon series in Colossians, I'm going to read a verse out of uh, Colossians 3.16, and then I'll pray, and then uh, we'll turn things over to Zach for graduation recognition. Let the word of Christ dwell in, your rich, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Please pray with me. Dear Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for Sunday morning and the chance to, uh, to worship you here today. Father, we're grateful that so many people are in this building this morning, whether they be members or regular attenders or this may be their first time here. We pray that uh, they came in with open minds and open hearts, ready to worship you. Father, we pray that uh, we be able to just show all of those folks the, uh, the heart of Prairie View Christian Church and what we stand for as we get ready to worship you through song, through communion, and through a sermon. So, Father, again, we thank you for Sunday morning. We thank you for the chance to worship. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, at the end of July, so several weeks from now, we are going to have uh, promotions and graduations taking place in our children's ministry. Uh, but today, as Craig mentioned, as you've maybe seen in the email, um, we're taking a moment to honor our graduates and their families. Uh, so every Sunday that we gather, we gather because of the gospel. We gather because of what happened on the cross when Jesus died to save us from our sins? Our songs, our prayers, our sermons, our conversations, all of those things should reflect that. Celebrating graduates is also a reflection of the gospel. God has saved us and given to us the Holy Spirit to make us, to make the church into a certain kind of people. Uh, my go-to verse, if you've been to one of these before, you've heard me mention this verse because I think it fits this situation perfectly, is Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So as Christians, we are called to outdo one another in showing honor. We are to honor each other with brotherly affection. And so when a significant task is completed, we should celebrate and honor and encourage each other. So this morning, that particular task is graduation, is school being completed, well, at least up to this point. Um, and there are two graduates that I'd like to acknowledge today. The first is Sarah Vega. Sarah Vega just graduated from Fishers High School. She is the daughter of Tony and Michelle Vega. Um, she has two younger brothers, Antonio and Jonathan, who are also students at Fishers High School. Uh, Sarah is planning to study in the field of aviation, uh, something about Prairie View and, and pilots, um, beginning with two years at Vincennes and then finishing her program at Purdue. Uh, the Vegas have been a part of Prairie View for a while, nearly a decade. Um, second, we have Bree Walker. Bree is the daughter of Joshua and Aaron Walker. Uh, the Walkers actually began homeschooling when Bree was in sixth grade, and they have completed their homeschooling journey this year. Uh, so she's graduated. She's taking classes. She actually already was taking classes um, and will continue taking classes at IUPUI. And she is double majoring, surprise, surprise, in neuroscience and psychology. Um, her goal is to become a phys physician assistant. And the Walkers have been a part of Prairie View uh, for all but six months of Bree's life. So if you do the math, that's about 18 years. As I said, our reason for honoring our grads is first, because God has called us to outdo one another in showing honor. Um, but the second reason is to show these particular students their 
their parents, their families, and really anyone else for that matter who's here this morning, that there is an entire church of people rooting for you and praying for you and wanting to see you succeed. Um, so if it's all right with you all, although ironically enough, our, our graduates are not here, but we can still applaud for their parents. For their, for, and this is being recorded, so maybe they'll go and look at it online and they'll get the applause. But if we could get a short round of applause for them, and then I will pray. So. All right, let, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your church. Thank you that you've given us a people uh, to live with and walk with, uh, to bear each other's burdens, and to celebrate one another, to encourage one another, and to honor one another. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who has made all of this possible um, through his death and, and the forgiveness of sins that he earned and accomplished for us, um, that we are brought together, uh, people who are so different um, in different stages of life uh, from different from different places, different backgrounds, all these things that you've just so wondrously brought together. Uh, so thank you for your church, the family that you've knit together. God, I pray um, for our two graduates, for Sarah and for Bree, as they move into a new stage of life, that you would uh, watch over them and protect them, and that you would use their families, use this church, use your people, um, wherever they may be, to help guide and encourage and steer them uh, in wisdom and godliness. Um, God, I pray that uh, they would especially be rooted in your love and, and know your love for them and uh, how you showed that love in Christ. I pray that we all would know that and that we all would be bearing with one another, bearing one another's burdens, encouraging one another, um, no matter where we may be. Uh, but Father, thank you again for, uh, for, the, for the church and, and just for the hard work that, uh, these families have put in and our ability to come alongside them and recognize that work and honor them for their work. Father, we love you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his precious name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun said.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy Yeah. 
like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. Worship your holy
have a seat. My name is Brad, and I promise not to talk about baloney this time like I did the last time. Instead, I'll tell you something different about my childhood. This will surprise absolutely none of you. I was a giant nerd. Uh, I, I still am, but back then, while my friends were out watching sports or playing sports, I was literally inside reading the dictionary. I just loved new words. I still do. I still do. So when I come across one, it, it excites me, one that I've never read before. And I did recently. I came across the word automaticity. Automaticity. Can anyone define it for us today? No, good, because that makes me feel better. I had to look it up too in my dictionary. Automaticity is the phenomenon that we can do some things without our brains being fully engaged. Like uh, making coffee in the morning. You can probably make your morning coffee while you're still half asleep. Or maybe you've ever driven to work and you can't remember your drive there. That's kind of scary. Or if you're like me, you've eaten a whole bag of potato chips without realizing it. Automaticity is a good thing because we don't have to think about how to chew or how to walk. But it's not a good thing when it comes to communion. Is this time here this morning that we put right in the middle of our service, at the peak of our service, is this time ever an automatic routine for you? You know what to do. If you're a believer in Jesus, you come forward. If you have an offering, you put it in the black boxes. You pick up the elements. You go back to your seat, and when you're ready, you take the bread and juice. That's a routine that is probably very familiar to you if you've been here for any time at all. But that can make it become mindless for us if we're not careful. Like brushing our teeth. It can become this if we don't think honestly about ourselves and about God. If you've begun to imagine that you're pretty good on your own, or if you've started to think of God as a doting grandpa, then Communion has probably lost some of its significance for you because you really have little need for a Savior. But God is so much more holy than we can imagine, and our sin is so much worse than we like to think. When God was forming the Israelites into a nation, they were called His people. But even they couldn't approach his full presence. When God was speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, if anyone tried to come onto that mountain, they would die. If anyone tried to go behind the curtain other than the high priest to the holiest place in the tabernacle, they would die. If anyone even just touched the Ark of the Covenant, they would die. That might sound a little extreme to us, but God was teaching his people to value and recognize his holiness and to see that they were so unholy in their thoughts and words, actions. They couldn't go near those blazing perfection of God. It wasn't safe for them, and God wouldn't allow it. Habakkuk 1.13 says this, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. God was showing them that their sin was vile in his presence. They had to learn never to treat God or their own sin casually. But corrupt as they were, 
they were still called his children because he loved them so deeply and because he's so rich in grace. They deserve to be cast away from his presence because of their evil, because of their wickedness. But God made a way for them and for us. And that way, of course, is the cross. Hebrews 10 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, by his body, let us draw near to God. But how can we do that? God hasn't changed. He's still as sublimely holy as ever, and we are just as sinful as those Israelites. It's because God is also perfectly loving and full of grace. Our sin is rebellion against God, and we deserve to be sent away from ever for, from experiencing his blessings. But instead, God rescued us. He washed us clean. Jesus bore our punishment so that in God's eyes, we could be wrapped in the perfect righteousness of Christ. You already know all this. But we take the bread and juice representing the body and blood of Christ every week intentionally to remember. We sing about the wonderful cross of Christ, but it's not wonderful to us unless we remember. Remember the truth of who God is and who we are. Let's be honest about ourselves. We know our own hearts. Who we are apart from Christ then we can more fully appreciate this time together. Don't take communion mindlessly on autopilot. Spend some time considering how amazing it is that the holy God would make it possible for you to be his child. There's nothing that will ever be more important than that. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, We draw near to you this morning, but not because we deserve to, only because your Son made the way for us. Open our eyes to the ugliness of our sin and the beauty of your grace, and then help us to appreciate once more this gift of salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for doing what we were absolutely incapable of. You took on our sin. You envelop us with the splendor of your righteousness. We take these elements representing your body and blood, remembering our great need and your amazing grace. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen.
Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us here this morning. When you really think about it, life can be pretty dangerous for your average tree. Trees may appear to be massive, immovable, and permanent, but there are real and numerous threats to their existence. Lightning can split a tree in two. Heavy rains combined with strong winds could uproot it. And of course, there are people with chainsaws to worry about. But an even greater danger could come in a smaller, more subtle, more unassuming form. Take the example of the emerald ash borer. Once this invasive bug takes hold in an area, every ash tree around could be dead within 10 years. The problem first arose in Michigan in 2002, and since then, experts have feared that by the time it's all said and done, 8.7 billion ash trees in North America could fall victim to the emerald ash borer. However, there are steps that one can take to ensure their tree's health. Certain pesticides can be used. Compromised trees can be quarantined. And other agricultural practices can be implemented to offset the emerald ash borer's impact. This month, we'll be studying Paul's letter to the Colossian Christians, discerning what it looks like to be healthy trees in terms of our faith. Paul uses agricultural images throughout this book. He speaks of believers in Jesus bearing fruit, growing into maturity, and yes, being rooted. We see that last bit of imagery in what may be the key passage of the entire book, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Paul says there, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. How do we grow into healthy, fruitful, mature trees in terms of our faith? How do we weather the threats that could split, uproot, or chop us down? And what sort of small, unassuming, but deadly dangers should we be on the lookout for? Well, as we see this morning in chapter 1, it all starts with being deeply rooted in the knowledge of who Christ is and the knowledge of who we are. So open up to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Feel free to use one of our Bibles if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't have one. But before we read, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for the beautiful weather that so many of us have remarked on earlier this morning. Thank you for creation. Thank you for the changing of the seasons. Lord, I pray that in what really is a busy time of year, the month of June, with graduations, as we've mentioned, and big transitions, and yard work, and all sorts of plans, vacations, many other things, I pray that you would keep us firmly, deeply rooted in the knowledge of who Christ is and the knowledge of who we are. I pray that our study in Colossians over these next four weeks can assist in that. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we read chapter 1 this morning. I pray that you would build us up in our faith, in our love, in our obedience, in our worship for you. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this place. Thank you for the opportunity to read your word together. I pray that your spirit would give us wisdom, give us understanding as we read your word. Help us know you and your son better, that we might glorify you more. We love you. Again, we thank you and we praise you for our salvation in Christ, that we've been reconciled to you. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Colossae was once a wealthy, thriving, 
influential city in the Lycus Valley of Asia. But by the time Paul writes this letter in the late 50s to early 60s AD, which is some 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Colossae had been reduced to a relatively unimportant small town. It was overtaken by surrounding cities that must have been more smart, vibrant, and entrepreneurial. On top of that, a major earthquake struck Colossae right around the time that Paul wrote this letter, leaving the city in shambles. And this all had an impact on the fledgling church in that city. Epaphras, an associate of Paul who planted the church, must have been worried about its survival. And while Paul himself had likely never visited Colossae and probably never met many of the people reading this letter, his preaching in Acts chapter 19 may be what led to the church's birth there. That's why one commentator calls Paul a sort of spiritual grandfather to these believers. And even if he hadn't met them, Paul cared for them. So what does Paul do when he detects a church at risk? Well, the same thing he always does. He writes a letter. The Christians reading this letter were probably predominantly Gentiles, meaning they were not Jewish. However, there were Jews present in Colossae as well. And those Paul's words in chapter 1 are mostly positive. You read this chapter, and it sounds like the church has got its act together pretty well. That doesn't mean that they don't have challenges. As we'll see next week in chapter 2, there are real dangers to this church's health. And while the threat may not seem all that intimidating at first glance, like the emerald ash borer, it can prove deadly once it takes hold. But again, this morning, we're focusing on chapter 1. So let's start reading in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. To be healthy trees in terms of our faith, we must be firmly rooted in the knowledge of who Jesus is, and the knowledge of who we are. Let's start with Jesus. What do we have to know about him? Well, first, he is the object of our faith. We see that in verse 4. Now, that sounds like Christianity 101, doesn't it? You don't have to be a believer in Jesus to recognize that Christians believe in Jesus. But it's important that those of us new to the faith, as well as those of us who have followed Jesus for decades, remember that our faith in and of itself does not save us. The object of our faith, Jesus, saves us. That's good to know, because let's be honest. Our faith isn't always perfect. It can be subjective. It can fluctuate. But the person and work of Jesus, that doesn't change. It never changes. The object of our faith saves us, not our faith on its own. Second, Jesus is the source of our hope according to verse 5. Specifically, our hope is laid up in heaven. So no matter what happens to us in this life, we Christians have something to look forward to. Sometimes the best thing to remember when times are hard is simply this. It won't be like this forever. It won't be like this forever. Believers may not always have reason to be happy. We don't have to pretend that everything's peachy all the time as Christians. But we always have reason to be hopeful. And third, Jesus is our Redeemer, according to verse 14. In the New Testament world, words like redeem and redemption were used in connection to the practice of slavery. A redeemer was someone who paid the price to set a slave free. And in our case, we were slaves to sin. And as we see in verse 20, the price that Jesus paid for our redemption, for our forgiveness, was his blood on the cross. But finally, we would be remiss to talk about who Jesus is in Colossians chapter 1 without paying special attention to verses 15 through 20. This is a very unique passage. It may be a hymn that Paul is quoting in these verses. But in short, everything revolves 
around Jesus. Everything revolves around Jesus. He is the fullness of the image of God. When you look at him, you're looking at God. Jesus is eternal. That phrase, the firstborn of creation, refers not to a time when the Son came into existence, but to his preeminence over creation. He's more important, more superior to anything and everything else. The Son is uncreated and eternal. He always has been. Jesus is the head of the church, which is both a reference to his authority over the church and the fact that he is the church's source of life. And because Jesus is the head of the church, that's why someone like me can go on a sabbatical in the month of July. And the church will be okay because I'm not really in charge. And Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to rise from the grave the way he did. But others, believers like you and me, will follow him in our own resurrection. So to be healthy trees in terms of our faith, we must be deeply rooted in this knowledge of who Jesus is. Because at the end of the day, everything revolves around him. A professing believer who doesn't know who Jesus is is like a hollow log. It might have some things in common with a healthy tree. It's hard. It has bark. It's round. But it is so empty, so different, that it can't possibly be called a healthy tree. So if we claim to be Christians, Colossians 1 challenges us to center our lives around Jesus. If he really is the object of our faith, the source of our hope, and our redemption from sin, death, and judgment, then our lives must revolve around him. How can they not? And if you don't claim to be a Christian... Colossians 1 challenges you to either accept or reject Jesus. If Jesus really is who Paul says he is, the one before all things, in whom all things hold together, then the last thing you can do is remain apathetic or indecisive about him. So to be healthy trees in terms of our faith, we must be deeply rooted in this knowledge of who Christ is. But then there's the second part. We also must be deeply rooted in the knowledge of who we are. We might think about this in terms of our past, our present, and our future. Who were we in the past? For that, look at verse 21. Paul uses words like alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He says similar things in passages like Ephesians 2 and Romans 6. Sin leaves us dead. It leaves us captive to the world, the flesh, and the devil. It leaves us deserving God's wrath. Left to our own devices, sinners are weak and ungodly. Perhaps most frightening of all, We are God's enemies. But as dark as our past identity might sound, our present is bright in Christ. In verse 2, Paul calls the believers in Colossae a down-on-its-luck, insignificant, has-been of a town. He calls these boring, normal people Saints. Saints. In verse 12, he calls us heirs. In verse 21, he says we are reconciled to God. By faith in Christ, we experience a complete change in status and identity. We're simply not the same people we once were. 
We've been moved from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light. We don't have to stay in the darkness, thanks to Christ. And if you think our present identity sounds good, just think about your future. Remember verse 5. We have a hope laid up in heaven. Remember verse 18. Because Christ rose, we too will rise. In verse 22, Paul says that one day we will be holy and blameless above reproach. In verse 28, Paul states his goal of presenting everyone mature in Christ. Now, there's a sense in which these things can already be true about us. We can be holy right now, blameless, above reproach, mature at this very moment. But there's another sense in which we're still looking forward to seeing these things in all of their fullness. Our present in Christ is bright. We've been moved from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light right now. But our future in Christ is even brighter. So to be healthy trees in terms of our faith, we must be deeply rooted in this knowledge, not just of who Christ is, but of who we are. That includes remembering who we were in the past, as unpleasant as that may sound. It means celebrating and embracing who we are right now by God's grace. And it includes eagerly looking forward to who we will one day be in God's presence. You know, identity is a loaded concept these days. We hear all kinds of conflicting messages about where a person's true identity lies. Factors like race, sex, economics, career, education, politics, cultural norms are all held up as the things that define us. And sure, those things all matter to some degree. They can all play a role in shaping our words, our actions, our thoughts, and our feelings. Those things don't necessarily disappear when we become believers in Jesus. But the point stands that as Christians, our faith is at the very center of who we are. Every other fact about us pales in comparison to the importance of our identity in Christ. Remember what we said from verses 15 through 20. Everything revolves around Jesus, and that includes who you are. That includes who I am. So to be healthy trees in terms of our faith, we must be deeply rooted in the knowledge of who Jesus is and the knowledge of who we are. But keep in mind that that's just the starting point. What does this knowledge lead to? Think back to verse 10. It leads to walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Remember chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Healthy, firmly rooted trees do stuff. They grow. They produce fruit. They provide shelter. And the same is true of deeply rooted Christians. We don't just know all this stuff in our heads. We do stuff as a result by the power of the Spirit. We don't just talk about this stuff on Sunday mornings, as important as that is. We walk every other day of the week. Being deeply rooted in Christ, knowing him and knowing ourselves as a result of who he is and what he has done, leads to something. It leads to transformed lives. We'll talk about that in more detail in the weeks ahead, especially when we get to chapter 3, 
if you want to look ahead. But for now, know this. Who we are shapes what we do. Who we are shapes what we do. The indicative, that's the reality of our identity in Christ, is the basis of the imperative, the commands that we follow in obedience to Christ. We walk in a manner worthy of the Lord because we know the Lord. We don't try to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord in order to know him. It's important that we don't get those two things mixed up. Again, we'll talk about that more in a couple weeks. Now, if you haven't noticed, Paul really emphasizes knowledge in Colossians 1. He wants these believers to know the word of truth and to grow and increase in the knowledge of God. But then, ironically, Paul closes the chapter by speaking about a mystery. Isn't that the opposite of knowledge? In the Bible, a mystery isn't so much something we have to figure out. Like Scooby and the gang discovering the identity of the crook dressed up as a ghost, or trying to discern who killed the butler in the drawing room with a candlestick. In the Bible, a mystery is something that was once unknown, but has now been revealed by God. And what is the mystery of Colossians 1? Verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This glory is available to all who believe, Jew or Gentile, old or young, slave or free, rich or poor. That means that by God's grace, any dead hollow, rotting log of a sinner can become a healthy tree. But it starts with being deeply rooted in the knowledge of who Jesus is and the knowledge of who you are. We must look to Jesus as the object of our faith, the source of our hope, and the agent of our redemption. Because only then can the sins of our past be forgiven. Only then can we become saints in the present. Only then can we have the hope of glory in the future. So let Jesus have his rightful place at the center of your heart, mind, and life. Let everything revolve around him as it should be. Walk worthy of Christ by the power of the Spirit and be a healthy tree for God's glory. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your church. Thank you that we have the privilege of being called your children, the privilege of being called saints, because that hasn't always been true of us. But by your grace, through faith in your son's body and blood, life, death, resurrection, we have hope laid up for us in heaven. Thank you that we have this new identity, that we are not stuck in the domain of darkness forever, but you transfer us, you deliver us to the kingdom of light. And that's not just something we look forward to, some far off, distant place in the future, but that has an impact right now. So Lord, help us be healthy trees at this very moment. Help us bear fruit, help us be deeply rooted in the knowledge of who you are and who we are as a result of your grace. Help us be mature and help us walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you that you are the, the master gardener who can take dry, dead sticks and hollow, rotting logs and make us into fruitful trees. 
Help us bear fruit for your glory. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for our redemption. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. We are going to be singing a new song. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, as I've done before with, with these new songs, and um, it's not because I want to hear myself sing, I assure you, but we, I'm going to sing the first verse uh, just kind of simply, so that way when we jump into it, you'll be familiar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing the first verse, and then I'm going to uh, sing the chorus, and then we'll start the song. Um, I will give you a heads up that when we sing the song together, there are two verses uh, back to back. So you might want to jump into the chorus because that's what we're doing here. Uh, and if you do, that's okay. Uh, we'll just we'll all just chuckle and keep keep on chugging. So I'm going to go ahead and start so we can hear how this verse goes. Holy, holy is the Son of God. None can stand before His majesty. Beautiful beyond our highest thought. Worthy, He is worthy. So that's the verse. Hopefully you can hear why we're going to sing this song this morning. I'm going to go ahead and get into the chorus. All glory and honor, all power and praise be to your name, be to your name, for no one could rival your glory and fame. We lift high the name of Jesus. There's a bridge in there, but by then hopefully we're comfortable enough, we'll all just sing and, and feel good about it. All right. Holy, holy is the Son of God. None can stand before His majesty. Beyond our highest thought, worthy, he is worthy. Holy, holy is the word made flesh. King who bore our pain and poverty, come to claim the rebel and the
beside you, greatly to be praised. And hearing the lyrics, it got me thinking about what we just read in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, about Jesus as the firstborn of all creation and in whom and through whom and for whom everything exists, those grand claims that Paul makes about Jesus. Well, in Philippians chapter 2, another letter written by Paul, Paul says this about Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we have Paul, the same guy who wrote both of these letters. And in one of them, he says that Jesus is the cosmic ruler of the universe who you can't possibly wrap your tiny little mind around. And then in Philippians 2, he says Jesus is the humble servant who went to a cross and died a humiliating death. And there's party that wants to say to Paul, okay, which one is it? Uh, is Jesus this grand cosmic ruler or is he this humble servant? And I think Paul would answer, yes, he's Jesus. He's both. And if you have questions about this Jesus, his power, his authority, his humility, his service, all of that, by all means, talk to an elder, talk to a pastor. We'd love to have that conversation with you and tell you more about this Christ we claim to worship. But with that, we'll close our service in prayer. Again, thanks for joining us here today. Lord, again, we glorify you, we honor you, we worship you. Our words cannot do you complete justice in your greatness and in your power and in your goodness. And Paul's words come a lot closer to doing you justice because they're inspired scripture, but just human words in general can't really communicate how great you are. So Lord, thank you that in your grace and your kindness and your mercy, you came down, you lived a sinless life, you died a sacrificial death, you rose from the grave, you ascended to the Father's right hand, and you will one day return in power and glory. And as we wait for that time to come, thank you that you're in the business of turning dry, dead sticks and soft, hollow, mushy, rotting logs of sinners like us into healthy trees. Help us bear fruit for your glory in the week ahead, in all the places that we go, and in all the things that we do. We love you. We worship you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Have a good Sunday. And honor all power and praise be to your name, be to your name. For no one can rival your glory and fame. We lift high the